whole different thing going into the federal courthouse. So I was nervous all morning. I was just like sick. I was just like, just fine, you'll be fine. You'll... He was sort of sick too. You know, you just have that niche in your stomach, like, oh, okay. <laughs> We're walking into the, uh, and my text was just so many funny things that day, you know, just walking in off of the tiger and just feeling. But I'll tell you what, <clears throat> if anyone's read my Facebook, this is what I got that day. I got the federal employees looking over at the banner, because this banner was there. And they would walk in, we were in this big room in the federal courthouse, we had to go through security, and we had uh, the, uh, the Michigan Humane Society there, we had hospice was right next to us, and we're sitting there, Mish and I would, at the table with our stuff, and you know, they'll look over and they sort of do one of those, but when they walk up to you, what you get is, thank God you're here. Oh my God, it's the end. Thank God. They're happy to see us. Even in the federal courthouse, they were so happy to see that the cannabis organization was finally sitting in that room with everyone else. No snarls, no dirty faces. People going, oh my God, i got to tell so-and-so up here. She could really use it. Her knees are bad. And that woman was already there going, oh my God, thank God. <laughs> you know, tell me more about it. The nonprofits who are with us, they're like, you have more people stop at your table and ask you questions than any table here. We're like, we know, we do. You know, All of the other nonprofits are coming over talking to us. And you can miss screw, miss, not miss screw, miss skew, miss, miss, thank you, thank you. People's thoughts, because Mish had thought the hospice lady was just blowing him right off and didn't want anything to do with him. And so he had gone away, and she came by, and she smiled at me, and I, she came over, and she started to talk, and she was as nice as could be, said, we really need to get together on this. She agreed we needed to get together on this. Hospice it was hand in hand, unfortunately with medical marijuana. So by the end of the day, she had taken all of our information, because I said, you know, how about joining us at the fair? And she goes, hospice is so conservative, but you know what, all your information is going in the boss's box right here. So when they open it up, they see it. So this is what we get in the federal courthouse, the post office, everywhere we go. Uh, so it's a delight to be in the federal buildings, educating everyone. It's my favorite place to be is out of, or in the public where nobody knows, or they have a clue. And the cutest thing is, because we give these away for free, and uh, they'll come up and they'll say, well, this isn't for me, but can I take one? We're like, sure, you go right ahead. And everyone says it's not for me. Um, another thing we learned, which is very interesting, is this. So we were, we talk about everything. We had our Carmanos presentation out and things like that, and um, we talked about drug testing, and they're like, shh. Don't tell anyone, but no one here in the federal building gets drug tested except the police. We're like, you're kidding. Federal employees do not get tested. Many federal employees don't get drug tested. We didn't know that. We, I know. It was a while for us. So they can use cannabis. And that's what the one lady from Human Resources said. I'm getting, sir, I have surgery. I'm going to become a patient and I can use it. We're not drug tested. So I thought that was pretty cool. I did think it was so cool that I sometimes feel that our big corporations are pushed to drug testing by the federal government in some manner or way, but she said it was the cost, and who can blame her? It's like $200 for a, a test or more, so, Curtis? Yeah, the, the real reason is they probably wouldn't have no federal employees. <laughs> yeah, that's true, because they were all very happy that we were there. We actually had a, a very conservative, conservative looking gentleman come up and ask if Mish and I would uh, come out and speak at their men's club about medical cannabis and that they had a member who was a patient and he had passed away, but they'd like us to come and explain it. So just uh, just know that out there we have open arms. It's not like you think and we're not shunned. You should never ever be ashamed of using cannabis because you're smarter than everyone else that, that doesn't know about it. So you should be proud that you're one step ahead. You should fight the battle and never you know, be ashamed, but we understand privacy too. Some of us have to be private, and some of us don't. If you have to be private, you be private. You don't tell everyone if, you, if it's affecting your job or anything like that, especially when there's children in the house. Um, the uh, uh, Greens are still working on that case. They go to trial for that, and I will tell you everyone's opinion that I met in because the federal courthouse did bring it up. The post office brought it up. What about that case with that family? That's terrible. We just don't think that's right. They don't think it's right either. They don't think it's right. They don't, these, the people out there in the public, 
not in this room or not the patients that are understanding. They don't think it's right that that little girl is taken away from a family just because they use cannabis. So this is our public. So um, hopefully that uh, this, this helps them on their trial. Um, and I don't want to get off too far on that, and I did. But um, So that was our CFC courthouse experience. And on the 28th, we are at um, TACOM Warren. And that is our Army. Um, uh, and Warren, it's the, no, it's the Federal Command. Reserve. Tank, tank Command. What is it? Tank Command. Tank Command. Yeah. Federal Reserve? No. No. Okay. <laughs> it's Tank Command Military. military. Thank you. Tank Command Military. Either way, we're going to be there on the 28th to do another fair. And if you feel comfortable enough to talk to federal employees, these are long fairs. It was a grueling 12-hour day. <laughs> And um, Jim and uh, Steve yep. came and picked up the late night shift at the post office. We are more than welcome to sign up if you want to get in front of a federal employee and talk about uh, what we do is talk about what we do. We hit the facts of public safety and uh, keeping our, our um, residents in Michigan safe and understanding the act and also the health. We have another one coming up. It's the 22nd. It's the post office in Pontiac Metroplex. So it's a 12 hour another day. post office coming up, and then we have four so. more fairs. We would have been through all the fairs by now, but the government shutdown um, affected that, of course. So there were not many um, employees. So we were going to be hitting them hard before. I think it's November 12th. It's the deadline. So if you are a federal employee and you would like to donate to us, or if you would like to talk to your postman. If you take one of our brochures that are updated, it has our CFC code, it's 90376. You just report that to uh, your payroll, it's the federal government, and they will uh, take and uh, donate to us come next uh, year, I think we get our check. So. Yeah, they start, they start in, the ja in January of 2014. All right, let's see. I'm going to skip over the, uh, well, I'm not going to skip over, but I do need, can I get, do you have a green brochure, a new one? Mm -hmm. We used to talk about cancer and cannabis quite a bit. Um, we would have individuals come up and speak about certain conditions and cannabis, and we, um, we haven't done that in a while, and I uh, want to make sure that we stay abreast of that. This is an old one, but our new brochures have the conditions. And your main conditions of, and most doctors will tell you this, and even the stats in Michigan tell you, is chronic pain in our past year largest uh, patient base for medical cannabis in Michigan. And there are cancer patients, epilepsy, glaucoma. There are patients for every condition. What I found, though, was a lot of people, when I was out in the public, didn't understand that. They actually had conditions that they didn't know that they that were covered under the act and, and chronic pain coming in many different forms like arthritis or neuropathy and just things like this that are fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia. If it, they, they think if it's not specific in their written so remember chronic pain and it's not used to look for as an excuse chronic pain covers a lot of conditions so make sure you talk to people. If you are having constant chronic pain, you could definitely benefit, in my opinion, because I'm a chronic pain patient. And four years ago, when I had my surgery and I was on all of my pills and my bikes and narcos, which is what they give you now, and the sleeping pills and all of that, that's what I took. And uh, many of you have heard this story. I'll make it quick. But I began to use cannabis because I was more comfortable as a patient using it from morning until night. And I just stopped automatically on my own, um, with, and I don't take any more pills. It really helps chronic pain. Really helps chronic pain. In many ways, I just smoke. A lot of people juice. They eat the cannabis raw. It helps. All of those forms help chronic pain. So if you don't like smoking, and you have chronic pain, and you think, well, then you know, how am I going to treat myself? Because lots of all people also think that it's just smoking now that you do. So just understand you can juice, you can have extracts, 
You, um, there's CBD products coming out now. We're going to have to see if they work and great if they do. Um, so that is uh, one. I, I, always, I go to chronic pain a lot because that's where it's most misunderstood. Cancer is not misunderstood. If you have cancer, it's cancer. You fall under that condition. There's no question about it. Same with glaucoma, uh, epilepsy. Now, <clears throat> epilepsy, if seizures, there's a couple different things there. People may have seizures and not have epilepsy. They still are covered under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. So children who have autism, who have a lot of seizures, seizures are named as a secondary. So just know um, in those, if you know someone and they're questioning it, to uh, open your mind to that aspect of it. Do you have any questions on the conditions, any conditions, or does anyone here have a question about a specific condition? Is there a list there on that paper you have? You have to know what you have? It's not, this is our old brochure. I'll I, I'm pretty here. sure, well this, the conditions, part, part of the conditions are on it. Just, it you can have it, no problem. Um, we, we did break them down, so make sure that you know that and that you can help other people with that if they think, because we found that out, that was the case to be um, meeting with the federal employees. Winter season, um, as a 501c3, we cannot educate on how to grow your cannabis. We talked about this when we were transitioning to a 501c3, but so many people educate that. That, that was one thing that we didn't think we had to do. We really didn't have enough time in this kind of setting to do it properly, so we just completely discontinued that from our talk when we applied for our 501c3. So you won't ever come here to our meetings and find out how to grow your cannabis. But we can talk about things with your cannabis that affect you and your health. And this is the season, it's not the only season, but powdery mildew seems to be a problem in the winter. As a patient, I have found that to be and a lot of people don't even know that they have powdery mildew or what powdery mildew is. So it's something that as a patient or a caregiver for the health of yourself or your patient and your medicine that you should at least know what it is or what it looks like and what kind of environment um, makes it grow. So high humidity, dampness, no airflow, no light will definitely um, create, can create, powdery mildew. We have seen gardens that have just been topped with white and that patient thought that it was part of the plant which is called trichomes and it wasn't. It was powdery mildew and it will coat your plant all white on top. It doesn't have to get that serious but it will start out on your leaf similar to this. So cannabis isn't something people have been growing for life. I mean it's something new. You might not know what it is. Um, I have not found facts online that say powdery mildew has killed anyone or hurt them, but the last thing you want to do is provide plants to a, a sick patient, especially cancer, anyone with lung problems, anything with powdery mildew. So uh, it's on there. It, it will be shown in testing. You can see it. You want to avoid it. I've went through it. No matter what they sell you, no matter what they sell you, I'm going to repeat this three times, no matter what they sell you in the stores, it will not work. They'll tell you spray this on it, they'll tell you to dip it in up, they'll tell you to do this, but they'll usually try to sell you all of the stuff. It doesn't work, it's systemic. The only thing that I have found as a patient that works is to do sulfur burning and cutting them down <laughs> and throwing them away. And I, and I did as a patient with my, my, well, one of my first gardens, and it had powder, it all got cut down and thrown away. So there's, you spend money and time in your utilities, and the last thing you can do is have your garden be thrown away or not usable, and then you have all of those bills, and you still have to go buy your medicine. So it's very difficult. So be alert. Make sure you have airflow. For any plant, powdery mildew was, took over our community garden. It was just... Sometimes, depending on the weather, it can get your regular garden and uh, lab, uh, lilac trees are really good for powdery mildew. So if you've got them right about your house everywhere, just know it is uh, something that can create it. So just, uh, like I said, good airflow, lots of light, no dampness, 
and watch your humidity. So that's a note on powdery mildew. You're more than welcome if anyone wants to take these or Google it. Uh, powdery mildew on plants, it's the same for any plant as it is a cannabis plant. So um, they talk a lot about it on vegetables and things like that. Not to digress, but we do have 4271 and 4271 and powdery mildew um, kind of go hand in hand because if your crop gets wiped out, that's your medicine. I mean, the, one of the things that I've talked to more members of my family trying to get them to understand why they need to take a position for medical marijuana is because it's the only medicine somebody says, go buy some seeds and grow it yourself or get somebody else to grow it for you. Right. Um, nobody hands you a slice of bread and said, go make your own mold, cure your own gonorrhea, go grow penicillin in six months. Nobody does that, but they do that for medical marijuana. That's why we need dispensing in some form. That's why people are suffering that don't need to suffer because of the devastation of working with an I think what Steve is saying as far as the uh, uh, dispensary, is one of the things in the House bill is they're looking for mandatory testing. Well, we've got a lot of new people here. You know, we oh, yeah, absolutely. Supporters. Sure. And also, you know, this is not a this is not a rosy path. This is right. something you're choosing to grow up to to develop something naturally or to take something naturally as medicine. It's important, you know. While while you're here, we invite you all to get involved with this. Uh, this campaign for 4271. Harry Mildew is one of those examples of things that can go wrong. And it's it's still though, see, you know, and we can debate this because there's a good debate on the 4271 for mandatory testing. I am all about the free market. I don't think we know enough about testing yet to really define um, what the variance is. So when we get to the variance, because I know how they test, you can have a full pound and you take in one bud, <laughs> they test. Well, by the time they tested and you got your results back, this could have gotten moist and molded and they might see it when it comes back or not. So there's a variance there. We have to determine that. They need to know that before they pass legislation on mandatory when the testing isn't even full scale yet. So that's my opinion on it. But get involved in 4271. We're going to move on to Brian Crane. He had a great topic uh, to talk about tonight. Well, it's not a very hey, popular topic. I can I put my that one ahead just so that everybody's here? The cannabis one? Well, either way. Either, Mine's really quick. Yeah. Mine's really quick. Okay, go yeah, ahead. Really quick. So. We're going to move to Mesh to uh, really quick. put his quick one up first. Because everyone's here. Um, uh, we got uh, Dr. Sunil Agarwal on our medical advisory board. He's a, legal, he's a lead, leading cannabis researcher in the world. Uh, and he is now going to be doing webinars for physicians through our organization. So if you know of any physicians that are on the fence about cannabis and they're your primary uh, care physicians, they could be specialists, anything like that, and they want to know how cannabis works with the human body, this is the webinar they want to be part of. Okay? It's a free webinar for, all, for physicians to join. Uh, they can join the call. Uh, they can interact with Dr. Agarwal. He is, like I said, he's a leading cannabis researcher. He worked for NIDA. He did uh, special projects at the National Institute of Drug Abuse on cannabis specifically. That was what he was specialized in. Um, he also works at the National Is Institute of Health. Um, he does. Uh, he's done a number of cannabis studies. He's got uh, live clinical studies, all kinds of stuff. So please, if you do know you're, you have a physician or you have a primary physician, that you feel is on the fence about cannabis, this is the webinar for them to join. This is one of four parts. We're going to be doing a part every single month till probably January, and then after that we're going to do a full-on symposium. So keep that in mind. It's 22 spots available. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to bring Brian up, and we are we're going to, Brian's going to talk about search warrants and uh, Fourth Amendment. Fourth Amendment, and uh, he's our uh, on our advisory board, and he's a great attorney, and we are so happy that he comes here to talk to all of you every two weeks. Thanks. My name is Brian Crane. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I'm here to talk tonight about search warrants. And I've made up a little handout here, 
and I guess I should have handed them up before so you could follow along. Um, but I get a lot of questions about, uh, thank you, I get a lot of questions all the time about search warrants and whether the police are allowed to come on somebody's property and take this or do that. And this, it's a really, really complex law and it does come down to a case-by-case -case basis. But I prepared this little flow chart here to help people understand the basics of how it works. Because under the Fourth Amendment, you have a right against unreasonable searches. And that's what the language of the Constitution says in the Fourth Amendment. But by looking at the chart, you can see where it starts. First of all, you have a Fourth Amendment right against the government. If the government wanted to search you and get around the Fourth Amendment, the easiest way for them to do that is to just have somebody else do it. So you can see on the chart where you start, where any Fourth Amendment analysis starts, because it's always the Fourth Amendment when it's a question of searches and seizures. And it starts with, is it a government agent? Because a lot of times, where does this come up? It comes up in schools, where you have uh, schools or you know field trips, something where it's questionable whether somebody is part of the government or not. And if it's questionable, the issue becomes, and I didn't write this on the sheet, the issue becomes, are they deputized as a member of law enforcement? In other words, they're going to be treated like it's the government if they're acting on behalf of the police or the government. The second issue is, is there a reasonable expectation of privacy? Because the Fourth Amendment does not require a warrant unless, there, unless it's in a place that the law already says that there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. You have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your home, and in fact, even your guests do, assuming that they're staying overnight. Then they have a reasonable expectation of privacy as well. And a warrant is generally required in those places. But you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the location of your vehicle on a public highway, for example. You don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in things that are left in your trash out for collection. And most importantly, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in something that's considered curtilage, which is an area around your home, although it may be on your property, that's not really directly connected to your home. And this is important for medical, uh, medical cannabis growers because now what they've done is they've redefined and closed lock facility to basically mean a barn or a greenhouse outside. I mean, if you follow the definition of a closed lock facility, the best way to follow that definition is to put it outside, have it locked, make it a barn or greenhouse. However, at the same time as you do that, you may be giving up a reasonable expectation of privacy and making it so that where the cops would otherwise have to have a search warrant to come in there, now all they need is probable cause. So question, the third question on the sheet, assuming that, by the way, if the answer to either of the first two questions is no, then the search is not challengeable under the, uh, under the Fourth Amendment. You may have other challenges, just not under the Fourth Amendment. The next uh, question, if the answer to those two is yes, is does the government have a warrant? Did they take a cop and go before a judge or magistrate, which generally happens in a little room, it's not always in a courtroom, raise their hand and swear to certain facts and then the judge or magistrate will say that they find probable cause, they'll sign the warrant, and do they have a warrant? If they don't, then you can follow the no arrow and they're going to have to have a warrantless exception. Even if they don't and the answer is yes, they've got a search warrant, you continue on down the line. Then you have to ask, is the warrant proper? Is it based on probable cause? Was it issued by a neutral and detached magistrate? <coughs> Going, If the answer is yes to that, then was it properly executed? Was it without unreasonable delay? They can't just get a warrant in 2013 and then wait for something to come up later and execute it whenever they feel like it. They've got to execute it without unreasonable delay. That changes, by the way, in every case. Um, secondly, is the knock and announce rule. Unless the cops believe, even if they have a warrant in, your, in their hand, unless they have a reason to believe that by knocking on the door and announcing their presence, police, you know, search warrant, you think of the raid teams with their vans that they have in Detroit and everything, unless they have a reason to believe that by doing that, evidence would be lost or destroyed or somebody would be put in danger, then you have an entitlement to have them knock and announce their purpose. Um, 
And by the way, in case I forget to mention this later, if you're not home and they do execute a warrant by breaking into your house, they will leave what's called a return and tabulation, which is a list of what they took. And they'll have a copy of the warrant and they'll leave it sitting on your table. That's what happened to Steve Green in his case, I believe. Um, I, think, I don't even think he was home, to my knowledge. I forget. Um, but anyway, so let's go on one step down the line. And was it, oh, I was already there. Was it properly executed? Um, if the answer to that is yes, then the search is not challengeable under the Fourth Amendment. The government has met all of their requirements. But if the answer, as you can see on that chart, to any of those questions is no, then they've got to have a warrantless exception. Most of the evidence seized in criminal prosecutions, and most of the cases that I hear about, I'd say, I'd put it around 90%, are cases where the evidence is seized without a warrant and the government, assuming that there's a reasonable expectation of privacy where they took it from, the government is taking it based on one of the warrantless exceptions. And you'll see the list down there. Um, one of them is uh, search incident to arrest. If they're arresting you and booking you on a charge, they have a right to search your body. If they find something incriminating that they didn't know about, uh, then that's not a violation of the Fourth Amendment. There's the automobile search, okay? If you are pulled over for any purpose, and by way of their, the police's uh, uh, interaction with you, they believe that they have evidence that there's, uh, they believe that they have a, uh, reason to believe that there's evidence of a crime inside of your vehicle, they may have probable cause, and they're going to search your car. It's a really common question that I get. Well, the cops just pulled me over, they put me in the back of my car, and they searched my car. Don't they have to ask for my permission or have a warrant? Well, it depends. Because if they smell marijuana in the car, and you admit to something, you know, I mean, they, they build a chain of evidence, and if they believe that there is something unlawful inside the vehicle, they may have probable cause to search your automobile. Our Michigan Supreme Court has held that you do not have as much of an expectation of privacy in your vehicle as you do in your home. So it, it can be different levels. There's plain view. If something is out in plain view from a public place, of course you're not going to be able to, to claim that they violated the Fourth Amendment by seeing it or seizing it or developing probable cause to take it. What's the obvious lesson there? Don't leave shit out in a place where the cops can see it. Um, and that includes by air, too, by helicopter, because if you, uh, a lot of the sheriff's departments nowadays, like, uh, like JNET, for example, the Jackson, it's basically a, a division, the state police has an aviation division, by the way, where they fly over with a helicopter. Well, that's what I'm talking about, really. When you say plain view, that's what's most likely to be an exception to the search warrant. That's where it's most likely to come into play. Then there's consent. That one is obvious. I mean, they try to, the police will threaten people to try to get their consent to search the vehicle or the home. And the most common thing that they say is they say, well, you can either give us consent to search or we'll go get a warrant. The response, as I always say, is please do. Because maybe their procedures are screwed up in getting the warrant and you can challenge that later. By making them go through the process and by giving up nothing, you're affording yourself more opportunities to attack the process at each stage. Because here's what it all comes down to in the end. If they violate the law, and if they weren't allowed to seize or search the, search the place, or seize the evidence under the Fourth Amendment, either because a warrantless exception does not apply, or because they had a warrant, but it was defective, what do you get under the, what they call the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, whatever evidence they took, under that exclusionary rule is not admissible as a general rule in court against you. And it's really, really hard to prosecute a, let's say, possession of marijuana charge if they can't introduce the marijuana into evidence. So these things are all important. That's all I have to say tonight. So, uh, What about the lockup box? The lockup box. You can refer what? to the vehicle one? Right. Um, what's the question? Do they have the right to ask you to open it? Do they have the right to? Yeah, they, they have the right to ask you to open it. Um, but I would refuse. Make them get a warrant. I mean, if you feel, see, here's the deal. You really can. The truth is, you really can help yourself by complying with the cops. 
But the problem is, is the average person, myself included, because not all cases have been decided.